Food provision in the early days of the Derwent Valley Mills. The arrival of cotton mills in the Derwent Valley from 1771 brought a need for workers and housing for those workers. There was also a need to feed those extra mouths. The Strutt family at Belper were particularly keen to solve this problem and used their knowledge of the factory system to increase efficiency in farms which they bought and adapted as the 19th century progressed. These farms included Dally, note the circular troughs carved from a single piece of stone, Shottlegate, with its ornate frontage and large farmhouse despite only a modest amount of land, and crossroads on the Dally Lane Ashbourne Road junction included water piped at height from a reservoir on the far side of the road. A Moscow farm, Stephen Glover's History of Derbyshire in 1829, describes it as follows. The Moscow farm buildings are fireproof, being built with brick arches. They contain a milk house in the centre. There are two wings, each of which contain stalls or standings for 25 cows and a bull, a calf house and open sheds for barren cows. The cow sheds are so contrived that space is left for a person to walk round each beast to fodder and milk it, and the conveniences for feeding and watering the cattle are highly recommendable, as well as the facility with which the stalls are ventilated. The farm contains about 170 acres of land equal to any in the county and has recently been let on a lease of 14 years to Mr Henry Turner at about £500 per annum, who at the same time contracted to furnish the manufactories of Messrs Strutt at Belper and Milford with 80 gallons of milk daily at 8 pence per gallon. The Struts, by this time, had their primary Belper residence at Bridgehill House, overlooking the mills from across the River Derwent. At the rear was a small-scale testing area for ideas, not a full-blown farm, but a close-at-hand model version. Beyond this courtyard, in the extensive grounds, were a number of glasshouses, perhaps not feeding the workforce, although they did from time to time, but including a peach house, melon house, vinery and others. The tomato house here is particularly impressive, with hot water used to provide heat, as can be seen from the large pipes. At St Helen's house in Derby, William Strutt, nearly a century earlier, had a hot house with steam circulating to provide a warm vapour for the plants. Some produce from the farms and other farms, such as Wildersley on the edge of Milford, were sold commercially at such shops as Louisa Collett's Belper Dairy on Bridge Street. The Strutts and the Arkwrights, and Evans family as well, saw the benefits of encouraging workers to have their own parcels of land to work, to provide produce and small animals which would enrich the family's meals. It also gave them fresh air to work in outside the mills, so although tiring, it was beneficial. Here at Long Row in Belper, at the very start of the 19th century, you can see that whilst the houses all have long gardens, an extra garden was available to rent, extending the opportunities for growing fruit and vegetables still further. Pigsties were also provided. Here at Milford, behind Hopping Hill, on what is now Shaw Lane, this 1819 estate map clearly defines the allotments provided by the Struts, some of the world's earliest. They weren't known as allotments in those days, but recorded as tater pieces in the rent books. Staying in Milford, these allotments were also created between the new Turnpike Road, now the A6, and the River Derwent. This is John Hunt of Milford, who won the Apple Cup in 1944. He's pictured on his tater piece in the village. And on the right here are the allotments provided by the Evans family for the workers at the Darley Abbey Mills. The mill owners weren't the only ones providing allotments in the valley. Top left are allotments along the side and behind George Brettel and Company's hosiery business on Chapel Street in Belper. At Cromford School, boys were taught how to make the most of the soil on the school's allotment. Richard Arkwright would sometimes use food as a reward. Each September, at the annual candle lighting festival, about 500 workers would process around Cromford Village before returning to the mill where they received buns, ale, fruit and nuts. This is Agnes Strutt of Bridgehill House and wife to George Henry Strutt. She did a number of good works to benefit the Strutt employees and the wider Belper population. During the Crimean War, food shortages in the town spurred her on to creating a communal kitchen at the mills where food could be distributed fairly and waste minimised. She opened a small cottage hospital for the workers on Bridgefoot 
which is the building on the right, and made it known that anyone unable to afford food through loss of work at the mills due to cutbacks or injury could bring a bowl to the hospital for at least one decent family meal per day, usually some kind of broth. Before the mills arrived in the valley, Belper was perhaps best known for one particular type of food, venison. A medieval deer park lay close to the town centre, although precious few people had the opportunity to taste the meat. By 1580, all the deer had gone, and in the 17th century it became farmland, becoming the park's open space from the 1960s. Another old tradition in the town was the horse fair, held at the end of October each year on the butts. Hundreds of people turned up each year and hundreds of animals exchanged hands. It was also when agricultural workers were signed up for a year's work. It paid to be healthy in October, as a decision would be made as to how much you were worth or whether you were even fit enough to earn your keep. Harsh times. It was, naturally, a popular event for children, as can be seen in this photograph from the 1860s. It's been said it was something of a tradition to first buy a pie from the baker on the edge of the butts next to the National School and eat it on the step before exploring the pens. The horse fair faded away to gradually be replaced by what we would more readily recognise as the modern fairground. But livestock was still regularly sold in Belper with the advent of the cattle market from 1904. This too finally ended in October 1965 and the empty stalls can be seen here just before they were swept away. It's now Field Lane Car Park. That's the story of meat, but what about fruit and vegetables? John Gratian, a tenant of the Struts, developed a most effective market garden in the town already in operation by the time this strut map was produced from 1805. With the help of a little colour, you can see Gratian's great field in red, running from above the short rows, uphill, to where Swinney Lane breaks away from Penn Street. Gratian's little field, in blue, was a little to the south and would be reduced in size when they built the Chesterfield Turnpike Road, what we call Chesterfield Road today, which is picked out but clearly not yet built at the time the map was first drawn up. A contemporary description, printed in 1813, states that since 1805, Gratian had collected the rich human manure from 50 of the mill workers' cottages in a cesspool at the top of his garden and it ran down small trenches in the winter to enrich the soil for growing cabbages, potatoes, broad beans, then broccoli, peas, onions and carrots. A special scoop was used to get the enriched water up to the trenches above the cesspool. It's claimed that Gratian was one of the first to grow carrots on a large scale and had been particularly successful using his unusual method of fertilising the soil, his carrots being much sought after by all but the most squeamish. This is a view of Swinney Lane from the Chesterfield Road, with some of the Gratian fields below on the left. This more modern view shows the houses that have been built over his great field between Chesterfield Road and the mills. Different people received different meals in those days, as you'd expect. This was the original refectory at the Herbert Strutt School when it first opened in Belper in 1909. Across the road, in the Union Workhouse, it was simple benches and a small cloth for the inmates, even at Christmas. And the inmates would prepare and serve their own simple meals. Produce has been celebrated for centuries with the annual church harvest and the Derwent Valley is no different, as can be seen here at St Faith's Chapel at Belper Lane End about 120 years ago. Of course, the provision of food changed beyond all recognition with the coming of the supermarket. Belper's first was fine fare in October 1963. Can you see a couple of police helmets in the crowd? The crowd was so huge for the opening ceremony, by the Dagenham Pipers no less, that they feared a riot, so extra police were drafted in from other local towns just in case. In the end, everyone behaved themselves, and all those who waited in the massive queue for a free bag of frozen peas with every pack of bird's eye fish fingers did get what they wanted, thanks to the extra supplies brought in from out of town. Supermarkets struggling to meet demand is nothing new. <laughs>